Welcome to the Bethel College Maybe Observatory. I'm Roger Reimer. I'm actually a maintenance man here at Bethel College. Mostly I work on air conditioning and heating systems. In my spare time I manage the observatory and under that function I'm going to be showing you tonight how um, our equipment works and what we can do with it. Um, we'll start with uh, a video. I guess I'll, the format of tonight will be I'm um, playing a series of videos partially because I recorded some of these back when we had clear weather and dark skies earlier in the year um, so that I could show you what we're doing uh, and as we're going along feel free to ask questions on the chat and between the videos I'll do my best to answer them. So we'll, we'll start with the the Maybe Observatory is located on the campus of Bethel College on top of the Crable Science Center in North Newton, Kansas. The primary telescope housed in the dome is a 16-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain on a polar-mounted computer-controlled drive. The axis of the polar mount is aligned with the axis of the rotation of the Earth, allowing the telescope to track celestial objects by moving in one direction. The dome is motorized and can be linked to the telescope so that the opening in the dome is always aligned with the telescope. By sending commands to the drive, the telescope can be pointed at any object above the horizon. There are three basic types of telescopes. The refractor has a lens where the light enters and is focused on the eyepiece. A reflector has a mirror at the base of the tube which reflects the light to a secondary diagonal mirror and then to the eyepiece. The third type is what we have in the Maybe Observatory. Here the light enters through a corrector plate, travels to a mirror at the base, is reflected to a secondary mirror back at the top, and finally back to the eyepiece, or in our case the camera at the base. Here's a picture of the equipment on the back of the telescope, the, the imaging equipment. The first thing you notice on the back here is this knob which controls the course focus. The first piece of hardware attached to the telescope is a temperature controlled micro focuser. It is, has about a half inch of travel which is divided into 112,000 steps for precise focus control. Behind that we have something called adaptive optics. This has a lens mounted in electromagnetic coils which can make rapid adjustments to compensate for guiding imperfections in the telescope drive or atmospheric conditions. The next piece is an auto guider which has a small imaging chip that takes rapid images of a selected star and sends corrections to the adaptive optics and the telescope drive. This keeps the target steady for long exposures. Behind that the filter wheel which can hold seven different filters that can be rotated into position in front of the camera. There are three narrow band filters that pass light from hydrogen, oxygen, or sulfur gases three photometric filters, red, green, and blue, and a luminance filter which passes all wavelengths. Finally we have the camera which has a CCD chip that is 4000 by 4000 pixels in size. The chip is capable of being cooled to 30 degrees below zero Celsius to reduce noise. It is a black and white camera only. To achieve color images we blend images from different filters. One floor below the dome is the control room where the computers that control all of the hardware are located. The Maybe Observatory is located on the campus of Bethel College on top of the Crable Science Center in North Newton, Kansas. The primary telescope housed in the dome is a 16-inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain on a polar-mounted computer-controlled drive. 
The axis of the polar mount is aligned with the axis of the rotation of the Earth, allowing the telescope to track celestial objects by moving. Okay, I just realized I've got chat disabled, so you probably won't be able to uh, ask questions. And I'm sorry about that, but it uh, seems like I'd have to restart the stream to get the chat enabled. So, okay, I just realized I've got We'll have to apologize to you. I'm not a professional YouTuber, so I don't necessarily have a great command of what's going on here. Um, the next step I want to take is to show you um, how we. I guess you, you saw the pieces of the telescope. To begin with, you'd open the dome and, and get the uh, telescope pointed at a star and get the telescope synced. The next video I'm going to play for you is the process of syncing our uh, software up to the telescope and getting that ready to do imaging. The first step in beginning an imaging session is to open the dome and initialize and sync the telescope drive to a known alignment star. After this is done, we move to the control room and connect the telescope and dome to the software package. We use the Sky X Professional Edition. Once that is done, we center the alignment star in the imaging system and do the final sync so that the software and telescope drive agree on what the telescope is pointing to. In the image that you see projected here, this is the alignment star we chose, which is Sirius, and you can see that it's not totally, it's not totally centered. So what we're going to do is move to the telescope, At the telescope control panel, I'll be pushing the drive, adjusting it with these arrows. As you can see, as I move the telescope, the uh, star begins to come into the center. So now I need to get it over to the right some. There's about a six second delay as we're doing this because it takes five seconds for the image to download from the camera. It's taking an image, a one second exposure, and then it takes that long to get the image. So now we're getting close. Wait another exposure, make sure it's not still moving. Just bump it. So we now finally have uh, the star aligned in the center of our camera image. So at this point we enter the name of the star we used as the alignment star, which is Sirius. We hit Find. And then I hit Sync. It says, are you sure you want to sync on Sirius? And I say yes. So now the software and the telescope both agree on what they're pointed at. As uh, 
now that we've got that done, we'll stop this imaging. We can close that. Uh, as was mentioned before, the uh, chip of the camera can be is cooled to reduce the noise. And this is how we start that cooling process. We're choosing to cool it to 20 degrees below zero. And we'll turn that on. And you can look up here and see it's set to negative 20. The temperature currently is at 11. We're using, this shows how much power the cooling is using to uh, cool it down. The temperature starts dropping. While that's cooling off, we can move to the next step, which is to focus So to achieve focus, we're going to use the uh, fine focuser that I showed you earlier. First thing we want to do is move to a suitable star to focus on. Sirius would be much too bright. Um, the star that I'm going to be using tonight is uh, in the catalog is HIP31. Seven hundred. I'll hit find. It's real close to Sirius. Here you can see. So then I hit slew. It says, "Do I really want a slew there?" And I say, "Yes." You can see this is where the telescope is pointing now. We'll switch back to the camera. I don't want to take photos continuously now, but I'm going to take a photo to see how what we've got here. Once again, it's a one second exposure. Yes, this will be, this should work. So now I'm going to uh, go to this tool that we use to achieve focus. They start by taking a sample photo. Uh, I didn't give it correct exposure here. I should have changed that. And I also don't want that filter. So, well, actually. Yeah, we'll switch to the L filter, which is basically clear. Tenth of a second looks like it will work, so I'll take another sample. It's switching filters, and then it'll take the image. Downloading. Then I will zoom in on it, set subframe to the current view. We'll take another image. That makes the image smaller so that it downloads faster. And I'll say autofocus now. So now I'll start taking a series of images. and looking to achieve the best focus. The first thing it's doing, if you look up here, is moving the focuser to a suitable starting position, taking a picture. It takes three pictures to uh, compensate for the Basically, it's averaging them. Then it moves the focuser a certain amount and takes three more pictures.
So I can tell that the focus is actually getting worse as it moves along. So I'm going to have to reposition the focus on the uh, the course focus on the telescope and start this over. So I think I have the course focus set closer now. So we'll once again take a sample photo. Zoom in on the star we want to focus on. Set subframe to that view. And start another run of the autofocus. Again, you can see the focuser position here. There's 120,000 steps that this can take to achieve focus. So it's running down, closing the focuser, shortening it up right now to begin the uh, focus run. So there it took three images. Moves the focuser and takes three more. It keeps doing this till it finds the best position. Notice while it's doing this, the star is, is appearing to get smaller, which is what we want to achieve better focus and there are even dimmer stars out here that you can watch as they come into focus. So there it fits a curve to the results it got. It's going to move back to that position up here and take another picture to uh, verify. So it says focus success. So now we can close this. Um, so once we've achieved successful focus, we want to go to the Focuser tab and activate temperature compensation. So what's going on here is um, as you go through the night, a lot of times it'll get cooler and as the tube cools, it'll actually shrink. What this does is um, there's a temperature sensor on the side of the tube connected to the focuser and as the temperature goes down it'll compensate and move the focuser to adjust it by the steps that we've entered into there. We'll also now go and open a file What this is, is the offsets. Each filter will focus at a slightly different point. So these are all of our filters that we have in the filter wheel. And these are the offsets that it takes to get each of those filters into focus. So right now we're focused on L. If we change to the R filter, it would move it, the preset number of microns, to uh, bring it back into focus. So we don't have to refocus for each filter change. Then we go back to the camera, and we are finally ready to begin an imaging session. So that's the process for getting the telescope pointed at the right place and getting it focused. Um, this is all pretty tedious, but it's also very important. If you don't have good focus, none of your images will be worth anything. 
and by having it accurately aligned when you go to different parts of the sky it will more likely hit the, the targets you're aiming for if you're not very accurately aligned then you won't the uh, next piece in the puzzle is actually capturing images and that involves setting up auto guide which um, I'll explain that in this piece. Uh, Dwight Crable has set up a chat room in Moodle, so if you have questions, you can um, go through that route and he'll relay them to me and I'll see if I can answer them. So I'll go ahead and start the uh, video that uh, goes through auto guiding and image capture. To begin imaging, first we uh, choose a target that we want to image. Um, in this case, we're going to look for 2264. I've already hit find. It's right over here. We'll go ahead and slew to that. Telescope's pointed down here at Sirius right now. And now it's moving. After the telescope stops, we'll take a test exposure to verify that the target is in the field of view. So we'll switch back to camera. And we will take, uh, oh, let's do a 10 second exposure. And Take photo. And I believe that's correct. So basically all we're seeing there is stars. So let me move this to the side and we'll zoom in here. As we get closer you can see the uh, field of view or the camera is superimposed. So what I want to go take a picture of I think is right here. So I'm going to click on that, slew, say yes. This is the Cone Nebula, which is part of um, NGC 2264. So once it stops moving, we'll go ahead and uh, Wait till it's for sure it's done. Another 10 second exposure. The focus, um, I'm sorry, the filter wheel is still on L. Go back to camera, take photo. It's exposed, counting down to 10 seconds. Downloading the image. I think this will be okay. So, next thing we want to do is set up auto guiding. So, let's Got a half second exposure. I'll clear the subframe, take photo, and see what it gives us. So, with a half second exposure, it's finding these stars. Um, I'm going to go to focus tools. When I'm in focus tools, I can take photo continuously. And I'm going to go down to the 
switch to half second again. Okay, and I'll start taking these continuously. And now what I want to do is move slightly. And I'll stop that, go back to auto guide, take photo. Click subframe, draw a square around the star I want to use, take photo, double click on it, and start auto guiding. This is what auto guiding looks like. It's taking a picture every half a second. The, uh, the mirror that, or the lens I told you about, the uh, adaptive optics unit, it's reading out down here. So that gives you a, a, the numbers of how the mirror is tilted. Um, what happened there is the dome just moved, which shakes our camera. So when we're uh, imaging, we shut the sink off on the dome so that uh, it doesn't happen while we're in the middle of an image. So this is tracking pretty well. I'm happy with the with the guide with the auto guiding. So we'll move that off here, go back to camera. Actually, I'll go to filter wheel first. I want to do an image through the hydrogen alpha filter. So I'm going to move now. Okay, it's made it to the hydrogen alpha. So I'll go back to camera. We're doing two by two binning, which I can explain that if you're interested. But in any case, I want to do um, I think we'll do 300. Well, let's do 240 seconds. That ought to be enough to get an image. We'll hit on save photo automatically and take photo. So now it's counting down the 240 seconds and when that's done it'll download the image. The whole while we're doing this the auto guide star is keeping the telescope perfectly trained on our target, as that star moves, or the auto guide star moves around, the mirror is compensating and bringing it back to the center. If the mirror gets to the end, we'll go up to the auto guider. If the mirror gets to the end of its tilt or to a certain point in its tilt, like here at 27 percent, the relays on the telescope, the motor drive, will nudge it to get it back to the center if the mirror isn't capable of of centering it. Back to the camera, and we're counting down. We got less than a minute left now. I hit pause there for a while so that you didn't have to wait. Auto Guide Star is still staying centered, so that's good. We can go check our mirror tilt. That all looks good. Back to the camera. This is the suspenseful part. So we wait for the image to download, see if we got anything and what kind of image it is or whether we had satellites streaking across it.
And there's our image. So that's the cone nebula. And this is in hydrogen alpha, so it's showing us hydrogen gas, which that's what, uh, you know, when you're doing nebulas, that will show up. This would be the same way that uh, the same filters that the Hubble telescope would use to do nebulas. As we zoom in here, you can see on the, on the dimmer stars, you notice that, that they're round. You can see the individual pixels. Here's also an example of, of noise on the image. Uh, there's correction images that we would take when we're stacking these images to uh, filter all that out and improve the, improve the image. But anyway, what I was getting at is you see how round the stars are. That's a good thing. That means our tracking was good. Um, you can zoom in on dimmer stars, and our focus is good. If there was kind of a half moon shape to the real dim stars, you'd know your focus was a little bit off. So all in all, that's a successful image. This stuff at the sides is... Um, noise from the uh, where the all of the pixels connect to the side of the chip. But anyway, that's how you capture an image. Um, I will later go through some images and show you what you do with them after you get them. To begin imaging, first we uh, choose a target. So that's the image capture process. Um, if you're going to catch a whole bunch of images, it takes a, a while to get any decent photographic imaging or uh, astronomical imaging. You, you need a lot of long exposures, especially on a target that's this dim. So after you've acquired these images, um, the next step would be to, to process them. So let's say you've taken eight or nine five-minute exposures of a given target, then you need to stack those exposures together to give you a exposure time of, um, realistically, it's like adds up, so it'd be over an hour. The longer you expose, the more signal-to-noise ratio you get, um, get it so that you can end up with a better quality finished product. The next uh, video... Um, Dwight's emailing me with a question. Uh, the question is, with this microscope, this is a telescope, not a microscope, can you get pictures of other things such as black holes and other celestial bodies? Um, this isn't sensitive enough to take images of black holes. Uh, other celestial bodies, yes, what we just did was a uh, was a nebula. We can do the moon. We can do planets. Um, how does the process differ to capture photos of these things versus just a star? Um, most of the process is different. You know, on the moon, you'd have to track differently because the moon is moving faster. Um, most of the other things, it's just a matter of setting your exposures and which filters you want to use. A lot of times to take images of planets, we actually use a high-speed video camera and um, it picks different images out of that high-speed stream to uh, get your best image. So the next thing, I've got a short explanation of how we begin processing an image. And after that, I will show you um, some of the images we've taken here at the observatory. So after we've captured the image, we're going to do further processing to it. This is a five-minute exposure through the hydrogen alpha filter. And the thing you'll notice here is how noisy it is. It's not a very good image quality. And we can clean this up. Um, here is a five-minute exposure taken at the same temperature with basically with the lens cap on and you can see the noise is still there so that's what we want to subtract from the previous image. Other things that 
you'll notice this is a, a what they call a flat frame, which it's a process of capturing the uh, blemishes caused by dust particles on our imaging equipment, the lenses and stuff, and that can be subtracted the uh, out of the image as well. So the first thing we do is load the uh, image files that we want to stack. So we have a number of five minute exposures of the same thing and by stacking them all it's increasing our exposure. So we'll open those first. Then we load the dark files. So these are a, a, a bunch of different five minute dark exposures taken at the same temperature as our image files. Flat files, the same thing here. We go find the uh, appropriate flat files. So these are taken through the hydrogen alpha filter. So they will subtract the blemishes out of that. And offset bias are very, very short exposures that are taken with a lens cap on that basically capture the electronic noise in our cabling and that kind of thing. So now we have all of these images loaded in our software. We would normally go through and check these images to make sure we wanted to stack them, which I've done before. So we'll just select check all. That means they're selected to be stacked. Um, and the next thing is to register the pictures, and this is aligning them that, uh, uh, that that's reminding me. By registering them, we line them up. It's taking the stars and overlaying them. So now all seven of those pictures have been registered. After we've done that, we stack them. I'm not going to get into what the settings are. And we end up with an image. I want to uh, save I've selected to uh, save this as a fits image, which will make it easier for us to show what we've done. So I'll go to where we saved that. And we have the sample fits. We'll open that. And you can see that a lot of the noise has been removed from it. There's obviously a lot more processing that could be done here. Anyway, we'd go through and, and get it to this stage with each filter, and then we'd move it into Photoshop and turn this into a color image. That's just a little short overview of what processing would happen after you've collected your images. So after we've captured the image, we're going to do further processing to it. This is a five minute exposure through the hydrogen alpha filter. And the thing you'll notice here is how noisy it is. It's not a very good image quality and we can clean this up. Um, here. So that's a rough look at, uh, that's a rough look at processing. I say after you had stack, uh, registered and stacked your images, you would move the uh, finished image into Photoshop where you'd, you could combine if we had taken the images through different filters. Red, green, and blue, for instance, we could take each image and put it on a layer in Photoshop and then create a color image. Uh, as I mentioned before, this camera is only collecting 
white, uh, black and white images because that's much more sensitive. Um, uh, I don't know if I explained previously, but every pixel can pick up a, a particle of light, whereas in a color camera, you have four pixels that have different filters on them, like in your phone. So, like one one pixel is picking up green light, and so it's four times less sensitive than just the monochrome camera. Um, I'll move to desktop view and get off get me off the screen and um, find some sample images that we've we've taken here in the observatory. Um, this is a image of uh, M42 or the Great Nebula in Orion. Um, many of you probably have seen this. If you haven't, find the uh, sword hanging down from the belt in Orion and point binoculars at it and you'll be able to see this. It's very bright and very large. Uh, if you're looking at it through binoculars, it won't be in color. This is a image we took. It's just a black and white image of M13, which is a globular cluster. Um, the M numbers I'm using are um, the Messier catalog um, created by an uh, astronomer, a French astronomer in the 1800s. He was actually looking for comets and he was cataloging fuzzy objects in the sky that didn't move, so they weren't comets. But by doing that, he created a really great catalog for us to, for, of deep sky objects we can take images of. So this globular cluster could have close to a half a million stars in it, and it's just part of our galaxy. This is a uh, nebula. It's been rendered in color, so we took it through probably three different filters. I believe this is the Eagle Nebula. Now here is an example of Three images taken through, this one was taken through the uh, oxygen-3 filter, this is taken through the sulfur filter, and this is taken through the hydrogen alpha. So that's the same, same target through three different filters, and you can see it's picking up different amounts of these colored lights. So in the next image, when it's been combined in Photoshop, that's one rendition of what it would look like. There's another example of M42 with it's a finer detail, more processing done on this. Um, you can see the trapezium, which is the four stars in the middle of it. A different take on the processing. So which, this would be using the same data as that previous photo. It's just a different level of processing, stretch in different colors. These are monochrome images we've taken, M51, the galaxy that uh, has a small galaxy next to it. M63, you can Google these M numbers and learn a lot about these targets. M64, the black-eyed galaxy, you can see where it gets its name with a dust lane in there that blocks it. And I say these were all taken here with our telescope and this camera system. This is a favorite of mine, Ed John Spiral Galaxy. The catalog of this is NGC 4565. Um, so there's a galaxy. There's another galaxy up here in the image. I think there may be several more in there yet too. This is a picture we took through a Canon SLR through a filter. This is the Sun. This is Venus. Uh, in 2014 Venus traveled between the Earth and the Sun and we were able to capture the passage or the uh, transit of Venus is what it was called. So there's another image of Venus in front of the Sun. 
One of the uh, issues with astronomical imaging with ground-based telescopes is uh, this right here is a satellite trail. So in this five minute exposure, probably for 20 seconds, this satellite transited across our field of view and make, made this exposure basically unusable. The interesting thing, the jagged lines that appear there are because the, the satellite is spinning and those are the solar panels on the edges of the satellite that you're seeing reflecting brighter and dimmer as it goes. Um, as more and more satellites get launched, there this happens more and more frequently. The other problem we have, of course, is light pollution. Um, being anywhere near a city makes it more difficult. This is a picture I just downloaded today and it shows the number of satellites passing over uh, a camera in just two hours. And a lot of these are identified. Most of them are Starlink satellites, courtesy of uh, Elon Musk. This is an uh, image that I took. It's approximately nine hours of time exposures of uh, through four different filters. There's actually two images. Our camera is square, so you, I stitched them together in the middle. Uh, this is the cone nebula that we have processed in, in uh, HA, and uh, that image was used in building this. So it's got red, green, blue, and that HA added together. Um, it, it, the object is called 22, uh, NGC 2264. Uh, the common name is the Christmas tree cluster. This is the trunk. The Christmas tree goes there. Up here we have something called the Foxfur Nebula, the Cone Nebula, of course. And these are all part of this. So that pretty much concludes my broadcast. Um, thank you for your attention. And like I say, if you have any questions, um, you can ask them on Moodle. I'll hang on here for a little bit and see if Dwight sends me anything more. I did figure out why I uh, can't enable chat because I marked this video as being appropriate for children and apparently that makes it so that you can't have live chat. And you can't change that during the stream. If there are any questions after we end this, uh, you can still send them to Dwight and I will, uh, with your contact information, and I, I will endeavor to answer those questions via email. Thank you again and good night.